Hello everybody, my name is Noah, and today we're talking about creating a golf performance routine. Now you may not be sure what a golf performance routine is, but hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll have a clear understanding and will be able to implement this into your own game or implement this with your own students. Now, before we start talking about creating a performance routine, first we have to talk about something called the optimal performance state. What is the best mental state for me to be in in order to perform my best in any sport or any activity where I want to have a high quality performance. So this presentation is based on the work mainly of three uh, people specifically. Firstly is Debbie Cruz, who is the creator of a company called OptiBrain, which is uh, a software which allows you to measure um, various brain waves, wavelengths, and from that identify whether you are in an optimal performance state. So the first part of this presentation is largely based on her research and experiences. The second part when we talk about the creating the performance routine is based on the work of Lynn Marriott and Pia Nilsson. So Lynn Marriott and Pia Nilsson created the company called Vision 54, which is very famous uh, around the world as well as written many books, including Be a Player. And I strongly recommend you read this book, particularly Be a Player. Um, the routines that we're going to be talking about, this performance routine, is based on the ideas, the research, the experiences that they have developed over the years. And actually, in their book, Be a Player, they also reference and talk about the work of Debbie Cruz. So I think that these three women's experience and work are very interrelated and that's why this presentation is largely inspired by these three people. So as we talk about the optimal performance state, first let's quickly talk about the brain. So the brain has a left and right hemisphere. So the left hemisphere we can say is more related to activities and domains such as logic, analysis, language, and numbers. Now contrast that with the right hemisphere which is related to creativity, imagination, rhythm, visualization. Okay, so left and right hemisphere are related to different domains. So here we can see the breakdown left and right hemisphere related to very different types of activities. We look at the left side, logic, language, numbers, analysis, critical thinking. Right side of the right hemisphere, creativity, imagination, rhythm, visualization. Now you may be wondering, okay, well, which hemisphere is more important for golf performance? Well, actually, we're asking the wrong question. What we should be saying is, when do I want to be more left or right brain dominant? Because obviously, we can't completely at certain points say, let me only use my left brain, let me only use my right brain. We're always a mixture of both, but we can say that, okay, when when I'm performing, do I want to be more left brain dominant? When do I want to be more analytical, critical thinking? When do I want to be more rhythm, feeling, visualization? So it's not about which is better, it's about when do I want to be more of which. So now we can go back to this initial topic of optimal performance state. So let's review some of the key characteristics of the optimal performance state. First characteristic is that we want to have reduced left brain activity four to six seconds before initiating the motion. Initiating the motion refers to, let's say for golf, initiating a putt, initiating your backswing. So four to six seconds before you start your movement, you want to have a reduction in left brain activity. Left brain, as we said, is more anal analysis, critical thinking. The second characteristic is increased right side activity one second before initiating performance. So as our left brain activity levels are being reduced, our right side brain activity levels are increasing. As we said, right brain activity is more related to creativity, rhythm, visualization. Okay, so left side is going down, that brain activity level is going down as right brain activity is increasing. Now the third one, is the cognitive state one second before initiating a movement is predictive of the, out of the outcome. I think this is very important. So 
Debbie Cruz talks about this in uh, on her website in videos uh, from their research that the cognitive state you are in before that one second before you initiate your movement is predictive of the outcome. So that's very important and critical for developing a routine because we want to make sure we're in that correct mental state. So let's review briefly what we just said is reduced left brain activity four to six seconds before initiating the movement. Then we want to at the same time increase right brain activity about one second before performance. And we just said the cognitive state one second before initiating movement is predictive of the outcome. So you're probably wondering, well, if one second before is very predictive of the outcome, what kind of mental state do I want to be in? What's the best mental state to be in? Well, the answer is you want something called high synchronicity. Right now you're thinking, what is synchronicity? So now we're going to spend some time reviewing synchronicity, what this concept is. So in order to do that, we're going to have to take a step back and review something related to the brain. So this picture here is taken from using the OptiBrain software. So as we said, OptiBrain software is developed by Debbie Cruz and her team. So here we have five w pictures, images of a brain. These are all measurements taken at the same moment in time. Okay, so the brain, we have five wavelengths. We have delta, related to sleep, theta, a meditative state, alpha, a learning state, beta, active processing, and gamma, which can be positively related to performance. Okay, now, we, we're not going to go into great detail explaining what is each one related to. I think if you're really interested in that, we can, there's plenty of information that we can review and that you can find to learn more about. But for the purpose of understanding and understanding synchronicity, first we have to just understand there are five wavelengths, okay? And then each of these pictures of the brain represents a different wavelength, but they were all captured, measured at the same time, okay? It's just that each picture, each brain here on the screen represents a different wavelength at that same moment in time. Now the colors. The closer the color is to red, the yellow, orange, green means there's higher brain activity levels. The cooler the colors are, such as low blues, means there's lower brain activity levels. It's not to say one is better than the other, it's just a me when we're measuring, the colors represent the brain activity level. Now, here's an example of a, a product called Muse, which you would use with the software, such as OptiBrain, in order to measure uh, the brain waves, the wavelengths, and then create these types of uh, brain maps. Okay, so this is the type of product you would be wearing on your head as you're performing to measure and collect that data. So now let's go back. We're trying to understand this concept of synchronicity. So let's imagine each brain wave is a puzzle piece. And here on the left, we can see delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma. Each puzzle piece fits together very well fits together very nicely, very snug together. Compare that to this on the right side now, you can see the puzzle pieces aren't fitting together very well. They're not matching, okay? I hope you can see the difference between the left and the right pictures. So we can say that the more matching the puzzle pieces are, that means there's a greater, higher degree of synchronicity. So we want high levels of synchronicity. So the more matching each puzzle piece is together, the higher the synchronicity level will be. So how is synchronicity actually measured? So it's a matter of how similar are the activity levels across the various wavelengths. Okay, as we said, there were five wavelengths that I mentioned earlier. So the more similar the activity levels are across the various wavelengths, that means there's gonna be higher synchronicity key thing is how similar. It doesn't say that the more active or the less active, the better. It's just saying the more similar the activity levels are, the higher the synchronicity is. So here, the first example is going to be uh, relatively low synchronicity. So if we look at, we can measure four quadrants of the brain, the front left, front right, back left, back right. So here you can see the first number is about 16, the measurement, activity level measurement. You can see that by how red it is. Then we have a nine, 3, 1, and 0 
as we said earlier, these are measurements taken at the same moment in time, just representing different brave, uh, uh, wavelengths. So we have delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. Then we get an average. So the average across that front left part comes out to be 5.64. Okay, and we can do that for all the different parts. But if we say, okay, the, lo the highest num measured number was 16, and the lowest measured number was 0 0.8 on the gamma. The bottom, the one on the bottom, the lowest measurement was 0 0.83. The highest was 16.65. Okay, so there's a very large disparity, a gap between the highest and the lowest. So they're not matching very well. If we're thinking metaphorically, that means there's the puzzle pieces aren't really snug together. So we'd say is low synchronicity. On the left here is that average, the map of the averages across each part. On the right is a different, uh, it's based on those numbers we just saw, measuring the synchronicity. So the average here for the total brain was 53, or that front left quadrant, the, the synchronicity measurement was 54%. Now, when OptiBrain is measuring the synchronicity, the more white the brain is, the lower the synchronicity. The more green the brain is, the higher the synchronicity level is, okay? So it still will be confusing for many people, so let's review another one, a better example of higher synchronicity. Here we have um, front left delta 0 0.65, then we have 0 0.96, 0 0.51, 0 0.48, 0 0.36. This is a very big difference compared to the previous example. Here we can see there's a very small disparity between, so the average is 0 0.59 for that front left part of the brain, but the highest to the lowest, the disparity is much smaller compared to the previous example. So because that disparity is much smaller, that means the, the measurements are closer together, which if we're thinking of that puzzle example, means that the puzzle pieces are closer together. So therefore, it's a higher synchronicity rating. So here on the right side, we can see that's the, that's the um, synchronicity measurement it's 73 on average. That front left segment of the brain is uh, measured at 69%. So when we're talking about synchronicity, the higher, the better. So we want to be around 70% according to uh, the work by Debbie Cruz. So the previous example was about 50%. This one's now above 70% on average. Okay, so here we can see the example. Now the colors are very different, but that's not to say that, oh, high activity is bad low activity is good. What we're saying is that in the left, the example on the left, there was a large disparity between the activity levels between all the brain waves. Whereas on the right, there was a less of a disparity and gap in the, the number between the largest and the smallest, um, the sm largest and, sm and smallest number across the various wavelengths. That's why the synchronicity level was higher. Okay. But if on the left example, for example, the highest was 16 and the other wavelengths were closer to that 16, they would all be relatively high activity levels. So therefore, those high activity levels would all be closer together. So the puzzle pieces would be matching more uh, s closely together and therefore the synchronicity measurement would still be high. So it's not to say that in order to have high synchronicity, you all, all the brain activity levels have to be low. Because a lot of times people say, oh, is it about thinking more? Or is it about thinking less? It's not about thinking more or thinking less. It's just about having whatever, if you're high brain activity or low brain activity, having the five wavelengths be closer together. So the key points for this section, left versus right brain. So we said left brain versus right brain. Left brain is more critical thinking, analyzing numbers, analysis, language, right brain is more feeling, visualization, creativity. It's not about which is better or worse, it's a matter of when do we want to be more of which, and that's going to come up in the second part of the presentation again. Secondly, we said the cognitive state one second before initiating a movement is predictive of the outcome. And so we said, if that's the case, what is that best cognitive state to be in that's going to be positively predictive of the outcome? And we said that is a state of high synchronicity and high synchronicity means that metaphorically we're talking about the puzzle pieces each of those wavelengths 
the puzzle pieces are snug together. They fit together very well. In practical terms, that means if we're measuring the wavelengths, the brain activity levels are closer together across the various wavelengths, which means that the activity level, uh, which means that the synchronicity will be higher. So higher synchronicity is the mental state we want to be in in that one second before initiating our movement. It's not to say that throughout your whole pre-shot routine, you always have to be in high synchronicity, but before you initiate your movement, you want to be like right before you initiate your movement, you want to be in a highly synchronous state. So now let's move to the second part. We can talk about performance routines. Now this part of the presentation is inspired and based on the work of Lynn Marriott and Pia Nielsen and, and the book I had mentioned earlier. So they mentioned this concept of think, play, and memory boxes. So these are concepts, abstract concepts. They're not actual boxes, but here we have think, play, and memory boxes. So what does that refer to? So think box is before when we're standing behind the ball, it's what a lot of people think of as a, as a pre-shot routine, which a lot of people have. So that's what we call the think box. Then as I step forward until I actually hit the ball is the play box. So it's where I'm executing the shot. And then we have after I hit the ball until uh, could be until for a considerable amount of time until you hit the next shot it could be the memory box. So it's after you've finished your, the swing. Okay, now we're going to start actually by talking about the play box first. So the one in the middle first. Okay, this is the one we're going to talk about first. So play box characteristics. So the first characteristics is that it is a sensory state. What does that mean? So we have our five senses, our smell, our touch, taste, our, our ability to hear, to feel. So when we're in this play box, which we said is either once we've moved forward and we're addressing the ball, we're standing over the ball, we're about to hit, that is the play box. Now, in that metaphorical play box, we want to either have a feeling or an image. Okay? We want to be more right brain dominant, as we talked about. And a right brain dominant state, you know, is related to creativity, feeling, rhythm. So having a feeling or an image allows us to access that be more in that right brain state. So feeling, what could that be? For some of the golfers we work with, that could be their tempo. An 80% tempo is a feeling for them. We have one player who enjoys having feeling that they take a breath in and then there's a low center of gravity that they feel like they breathe in and then they're pushing their down into their lower part of their stomach and they feel a low center of gravity. It could be feeling that you finish your swing on your lead leg. As you swing, you're moving the, the pressures shifting towards your, your lead leg. It could be feeling that you have a light grip pressure when you're when you're about to swing. Those are all feelings. Feelings are not technical thoughts about certain positions you want to make or hit. It's just feelings. Alternatively, an image is if you watch any professional golf, you've probably seen these pro tracers where you can the lines tr following the ball on the green or uh, off a tee shot or a second shot. In those cases, it's a ma matter of having a, a picture, a moving image of where you see the ball going. Both work. It could be a feeling or an image, but you have to choose one of those two. That's what you want to be focused on when we're in that play box. So we can say that this play box formula of sorts is a feeling or an image equals the play box. Okay? So the second play box characteristic is that we're saying it's right brain dominant. That's why the first part of the presentation was important to understand what does right brain dominant mean? Why is that important? Right brain dominant is a creative state related to feeling, related to creativity, visualization, related to rhythm. All things that are, are related to also having a picture in our head or having a feeling is a right brain dominant state. And thirdly, the purpose of the play box is to execute the shot. When we're in that, in that, sh in that space, the goal is to hit the ball, putt, make the putt, whatever shot we're hitting. So in summary of this first part, this play box is it's a sensory state, it's a right brain dominant, and the goal is to execute the shot. Sensory state is we're either choosing a picture, a moving picture in our mind, or uh, it could be an image in our mind, or it could be a feeling. 
but it's not a technical thought because technical thoughts are more left brain dominant, it's more analytical. It's right brain dominant, that's what we just said. We want it to be right brain dominant, so it has to be a picture or a feeling. And thirdly, the purpose of this moment in that play box is to execute the shot. So let's go back now to these think, play, and memory box. We just talked about the play box. Now we're going to talk about the think box, which a lot of people have talked probably more familiar with a pre-shot routine, but we're going to go into greater detail here. So the first characteristic is it's more left brain dominant. So why is that? Imagine that we're thinking of the wind or various factors. We want to be left brain dominant. We want to be analytical and make a correct decision. So you want to be left brain dominant. So when we're thinking, maybe considering the slope, a club selection, turf condition, the wind direction, a pin position, those are all left brain dominant things. We want to be analytical. We don't want to guess about what the wind is. We want to feel what we want to make sure we know the actual yardages and the distances we have to hit. But in this think box, we also have a feelings and images. But as you can see, those two items are in a slightly different color. Why is that? Because those aren't going to be as left brain dominant. They're going to be more right brain dominant. And we're going to get back to that in a second as well. So the second part is we want to make a clear decision in the think box. It doesn't have to be a correct decision. It has to be a clear decision. Most of us have all had the experience of maybe standing over the ball, about to hit, and then we're starting to doubt, like, oh, maybe I should change clubs, or maybe it's not the right club, or maybe it's the wrong distance, but you still hit the ball anyway because you don't want to change, or you're just like, whatever, you just hit it. That's not a clear decision because there's doubt. Now, you can have a clear decision. You say it's a seven iron draw with a little f seven iron draw to the left side of the green. That could be what you a clear decision, but in reality, it's the wrong decision. It should have been a six iron draw because of the, you misjudged the wind, but it could still be a clear decision because you committed to that decision. So clear decision and correct decision are not the same thing, but we want to have a clear decision when we're in this think box. And thirdly, most importantly, the think box is the purpose of it is to prepare us for the play box, to prepare us to enter this play box. The play box is what we just mentioned, where we have this picture, image in our mind, or feeling that we're focusing on. So really, the think box to play box, it's what we call bridging. In order to get from this think box, which is a very left brain dominant state, we have to get to a right brain dominant state for the play box. And this is where this bridge comes into play. It's a metaphorical bridge. So here we can see I'm standing behind the ball on the left image on the bottom left corner. As soon as I step forward in the second picture in the middle, you can see I'm stepping forward. As soon as I step forward, that means I'm in the play box. So, and then until I start making my swing or I finish my swing, then the play box is complete. So from think box to play box is a very critical point and there's a lot that has to be done in a short period of time. So from the think box to the play box is actually three steps. The first phase is analysis, the second phase is selection, and the third phase is experience. Okay? Now this may seem like a lot of information, but once you get used to doing it, it's a very quick process. So analysis is going to be, not surprisingly, left brain dominant. Selection is going to start moving us towards the right brain, more towards the right brain, and experience is going to be hopefully more towards the right brain. Again, it's not completely everything left brain, everything right brain. It's just an example that we're trying to move more towards a dominantly right brain state. So in that first analysis state, we're considering, as you mentioned earlier, club selection, turf position, turf condition, pin position, wind direction, slope. Those are all things you want to be left brain dominant. You want to be making sure we're coming up with a good decision based on the numbers that we have, analyzing. Then, once we're done with that, we then choose our feeling or our image. And hopefully that's something you've already decided before you're playing the round, before you're playing the tournament, is you already know, on my putts, I'm a person who likes to have an image, or I'm someone who likes to have a feeling. Or you know that some people, in their full swing, their images, they like images, and on their short game, they like um, feelings. But either way, the second phase is choosing a feeling or an image. So let's say you're someone who chooses a 80% um, tempo. So you say, okay, now I'm going to focus on my tempo. 
then experience is actually experiencing that. So there's a, there's a nuanced difference there between phase two and phase three. Phase two is actively choosing that you want to focus on your, your tempo. And three, phase three is actually experiencing that tempo. Same thing if it's a picture. Phase two would be a start, say, okay, I want to now focus on my, you're choosing to select that you want to focus on, let's say it's a seven iron draw shape. Phase three is an actually visualizing and actually experiencing, actually seeing that shape before you enter the play box. So all three of those stages have to occur before you enter that play box. So that you're ready from phase one to phase three, you're moving more and more towards the right side of your brain before you enter that play box. Because the play box, you want to be in a more right brain dominant state, which is related to feeling, rhythm, creativity, visualization. So that's why it's very important to move through those three parts. Let's review that. It's very important. Phase one is left brain dominant. Looking at the facts, looking at the situation, coming up with a game plan. Then you've decided, okay, I'm looking at the situation. It's a seven iron draw for me. That's the decision you've come up with. It's a clear decision. You're not doubting it. It might be the wrong decision, but it's a clear decision. Then you're saying, okay, I'm going to focus on my image now. So you're choosing to now move towards a more right brain dominant state. You've chosen that you're going to focus on that image. The third part isn't actually maybe closing your eyes, maybe your eyes are open, but you're actually seeing that line. The more clear the picture, the better. So then you're actually experiencing it. And then you're ready to move into towards that play box. You're ready to step forward. As soon as you step forward, you're then in that play box. So summary, think box at the beginning is more left brain dominant. But as we just said, as it moves closer to the play box, it becomes more right brain dominant. We want to have a clear decision, very important. In the left brain dominant state, we're trying to figure out what shot we're going to hit, and we're going to have a clear decision. And finally, the most important part, we're using this time to prepare for the play box. If we go through phase one, phase two, phase three, we are definitely going to be well prepared for that play box. So now let's go back to the third box, which is the memory box, which is one that probably people spend the least time considering or training. So the memory box, what is that? The purpose is to store positive memories. Okay, during tournaments, we're spending a lot of time out there on the golf course, we want to store positive memories, because we want to have a lot of positive memories in our memory bank as well. Secondly, we want to neutralize negative experiences. We don't want to be overly negatively influenced by negative experiences. Of course, we're going to have bad shots and bad experiences, but we don't want to react in a way where we're become we're storing those memories too much. We want to store their good memories and neutralize the impact of negative experiences. And thirdly, we want to go through a post shot processing uh, process during in this memory box. So we're processing what just occurred that previous shot so let's talk about this post shot processing really when we hit a shot the outcome could be four things it could be not good it could be good enough it could be good or it could be great okay if it's not good it's not a good shot you hit it ob you hit it in the water or just not good then we want it to be objective analysis so objective analysis means just explaining what happened, not an overly emotional response to the situation. If it was good enough, good or great, we want to create a positive feeling and memory. We want to store that in our brain. Again, good enough doesn't mean it was great, good enough, good and great. As long as it wasn't not good, then we want to store that. So let's go through some, some examples to clarify this concept. How do we process not good shots? Here's an example of how to do it. So first, the ball started right of my target line and landed in the water hazard. So you hit it in the water hazard. But you're very objectively in analyzing what happened. It's non-emotional compared to, I hit a huge push into the water. I always hit bad tee shots on this hole. Can you see the difference? It's the same situation, but the experience and the explanation is, is different. The self-talk that you're going through with yourself is completely different. In the example on the right, you're creating negative self-talk, creating negative memories. Whereas the example on the left, 
He's just explaining what happened. Uh, objective analysis can also be thought of as just imagining your playing partner didn't see where your ball went and you just have to explain what happened. Or someone, you're calling someone on the phone and they're asking where you hit it and you have to just explain where the ball went. The extra information about how you always hit a bad tee shot is irrelevant. You're just explaining, oh, the ball started right on my target line and it flew into the hazard. Another example, I hit the ball on the hosel and it flew straight to the right. You're explaining a shank, essentially, but if that's an obje objective analysis of, how, of, of hitting a shank. Compared to, I just shanked the ball out of bounds. Why can't I hit good shots under pressure? The self-talk is completely different. One is very emotional, overly emotional, having po negative self-talk and promoting, storing negative memories, and the other one is just objectively analyzing what happened. Thirdly, I pushed the ball right of my intended target line. So when you're putting, that's just a fact of what happened. As opposed to, I pushed that short putt. I missed another short birdie putt. I keep missing short putts. Completely different explanation and self-talk for the same shot. So we want to be, when we hit not good shots, we want to be objective. We want to objectively analyze what happened, not store negative memories. We want to uh, reduce the impact of the negative experiences. What about good enough? Now, good enough doesn't mean it was great. Good enough is good enough. So a lot of times we want to talk about just being realistically positive with ourselves. I'm not saying it has to be every time every shot's amazing. But the problem is a lot of times if when we hit good shots, we expect them to be good. And we hit bad shots, we're disappointed. So we're very rarely having real positive self-talk with ourselves. Because when we hit good shots, we're just expecting them to be good. And that's the status quo. And if we get bad shots, we're not meeting that expectation, so we have negative self-talk. So we're rarely actually engaging in positive self-talk. So good enough would be, I wanted to hit the left side of the fairway, but I still have a good chance to hit the green and make birdie anyway. So it still could have been better. You didn't exactly hit where you wanted to hit it, but you still have a good chance to hit the green and make a birdie. That's realistic, positive self-talk. You're saying you still can make a birdie. Or, I slightly misread that putt, but the pace was good. So it could have been a better putt, but there was a, there were some good elements. That's positive self-talk. What about good shots? You could just simple as, that was a good iron shot. I made good contact and landed it where I wanted. Great, that's positive. Normally, most people, if they hit a shot like that, it's just they're expecting it, and that's the end of it. There's no positive self-talk at all. They're not storing those positive memories. They're not positively talking to themselves about their chipping ability or their iron ability. As another example, I read that putt well and trusted my line. That was a good putt. Again, the example here is it's realistic, it's authentic, it's not pretending to be overly happy with the result if the result wasn't what you wanted it to be. What about great shots? Now, great shots, that shot came out exactly how I wanted. That was a great shot. You don't always have great shots during a round, but when you do, you should reward yourself for it by having positive self-talk. Okay? Or... I judged the speed perfectly. I gave myself another stress-free two-putt par. That's a very positive, authentic way of communicating with yourself. You can see how good enough to great shots, the way you're talking to yourself is slightly different, but it's authentic and in a way that is still positive in nature, promoting, storing positive memories. So the fourth characteristic is that in the memory box, we want to go through process and outcome scoring. So what is process and outcome scoring? After we hit the finish our swing, we have two options, our process and our outcome. So the process, we can score from one to four. One being the lowest score, four being the highest score. So what is the scoring criteria? Well, our commitment level. This is about our process. It's not the outcome. So the process, what we did in the um, think box and play box is what we're, we're basing it on. Our commitment level, as we said in for the think box, are we committed to the shot? Do we have a clear decision? How committed to the shot was I? The ability to maintain the feeling or image in the play box. As we said in the play box, we want to be focusing on an image or a feeling. So how was I, was I able to maintain a feeling or image in the play box, or was I getting distracted? Was I thinking about not wanting to hit it OB? Was I thinking about 
uh, the previous putt I missed? Was I thinking about how this score is going to impact my position in the tournament? Or was I focused only on my feeling or picture during that, during that, while I was in that metaphorical play box space? And finally, how clear was the picture? How intense was the feeling? So maybe, did you sort of have an idea of where you wanted to hit it if you're using an image, or was it very clear? Did you see the line exactly and you knew exactly where you wanted to hit it and how it was going to fly? Or did you not really have a clear image in your mind? Was the feeling of your tempo really strong? You could really feel the tempo you wanted to hit the ball with? Or was it not really a very strong feeling? Those, that's another pro criteria to judge yourself on. And this is a subjective. There's no clear and fast rule. But the more you practice this, the more you're going to be able to judge yourself accurately. So a one or a two means that most of those, like most of those elements from the process criteria you're not fulfilling. A three and a four means you're doing a good job. I think three is, 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 is good. Four means everything was really, really good. Ideally, you want to have a lot of fours, but even if you can get a lot of threes, that's, that's a good place to be. You want to avoid having a twos and one. So a three would be, you know, you were committed to the shot and you really were able to maintain the feeling or image while you were in the box, but maybe the picture wasn't super clear. It could have been slightly more clear. That would be a three. That's still very good, okay? Outcome could either be not good, as we said, good enough, good, or great, as we just talked about. And what's the process? What's the outcome and criteria? Very simple. The result. The result of where we the ball finished. That's the only outcome criteria that we have. As we said, if it was not good, we want to be objective in our analysis. If it was good enough, good, or great, we want to store that in our brain. We want to have positive self-talk and store those memories in our brain. The next thing we want to talk about is something called a performance scorecard. So using that, what we just talked about, we can create a scorecard. Now, in the example on the left, it's a Mandarin, but each hole, uh, the, the y-axis going vertically down is each hole, and the x-axis going horizontal is each shot on each hole. And so essentially what you're doing is, for each shot in each hole, on the left is your process, on the right is your is your res is your outcome you're scoring yourself for each so my t shot on the first hole how was my process was it a one two three or four and then the result was it a one two three or four so was the process and then you do that for your second shot was the iron shot onto the green what was your process score the process again is referring to how well you performed your routine from from think box to play box that time and there based on your commitment level as we said earlier based on the clarity of the picture or the strength of the feeling and based on how well you're able to maintain that feeling or picture in that play box and you do that for each shot if you don't have um, this type or you could easily create this type of document on excel or any sort of software you can just take a, a scorecard which one student did and you just block it down and then she wrote down for each shot Okay, for example, here you can see three and two, or four and two, four and two. So what does that mean? Three means her process score was a three. Two means her outcome was a two. And again, what I haven't mentioned yet is that these two scores are completely separate from each other. For example, she had a few that were four, one. She said that her process was a four. For example, on a sixth hole tee shot, the process was a four. The outcome was a one. So they're separate scores. And so this is a very simple way you can do that on any scorecard for your round. But the benefit of doing this is that you're, you, it gives you, especially during a tournament, it gives you something to focus on and stay in the moment and not get distracted by thinking about worrying about your swing or other technical thoughts. It gives you something to always rely and go back to. And then over time, you can also realize patterns, maybe that, oh, on this, this type of shots, I'm always struggling with my routine, but it always gives you something to rely on and go back to when you're in a competitive environment. So the fifth part is closing the door. Now what does it mean closing the door? It means that after the shot, after in the, at the end of the memory box, you finish your shot, you've gone through the processing of the, the process processing and the outcome processing, then we close the door. It means we move on from that shot. We close that door and we move on to the next shot regardless of the outcome. It could have been a hole-in-one, it could have been a triple bogey, but we're trying to move on from that shot to the next one. And we recommend closing the door by doing some sort of physical marking. That could be gently tapping your wrist, it could be 
placing your hand on your if you're wearing a hat when you play golf and pressing your hat it could be anything uh, it could be pinching yourself in a certain part of your arm but something that to you means that okay that shot is over i am now i can now talk with my playing partners i can now enjoy the the views on, on the course i can now prepare for the next shot but that shot is done doesn't matter what it was whether it was whether it was good or bad great or terrible in either case you're always closing the door and the reason we want it to be some sort of physical marking is that because it's a conscious communication with yourself that okay oh i i'm going through this movement now i'm done now i can move on to the next shot so Let's summarize the memory box. Again, as I said earlier, the memory box is something that most people have never even considered at all. A lot of people talk about the pre-shot routine, but not about this post-shot routine. So first, we said we want to store positive memories by having positive, authentic self-talk when we hit good enough, good, or great shots. When we hit negative, uh, we hit not good shots, we want to neutralize, those exp neutralize negative experiences. How do we do that? By having objective analysis of are not good shots okay then we want to go through a post shot processing routine based on where we go through looking at our process and our outcome scoring so that's the next point as well process and outcome scoring going through our post shot processing thinking about how well did I perform in the think and play box was I meeting the criteria and I give myself a score from one to four for the process and one to four from the for the outcome and finally, closing the door. Closing the door by after going through the memory box processes, by process and outcome scoring, after doing all that, then we have some sort of physical marking that represents the end of that shot, and we can move on, on to the next shot. So now as we come to the end, we're going to bring it all together, back together into a complete performance routine. So let's review, and then we're done. Think, play, and memory box. Those are the three boxes we have. As we said, think box, we're standing behind the ball. During that process, we have three phases. Phase one, phase two, and phase three. In phase one, we're being more left brain dominant, as you can see the picture of the little left, left side of the brain. We're looking at the situation, making judgments about the wind, the slope, what color we want to hit, the yardages. Once I finish with that, then I have a clear decision of what I want to hit, how I want to hit the ball. Then phase two is choosing either your, your whatever feeling or image you have in, that you've chosen for yourself, choosing it. And phase three is actively experiencing it, experiencing that image in your mind, experiencing that feeling that you've chosen. And remember, some people for, for their long game might like having a feeling and for their short game like having a picture or vice versa, or you might like having one picture. Uh, use pictures for all your shots or feelings for all your shots anything works but when whatever it is you're choosing it and ideally you've decided before your competitive round what that picture what that feeling is or you've already decided before your competitive round that okay I'm only focusing on my pictures uh, when I'm in that play box so then by going through phase one phase two phase three we are properly bridging creating that bridge to allow us to enter the play box okay and that play box is a right brain dominant state that's why phase two and phase three earlier by ch selecting and experiencing that picture or feeling is preparing us to be more in a right brain dominant state and so then we're ready to step into that play box as soon as I step as soon as I step forward I am now in that play box until spending time as I'm over the ball I'm all in that play box when I'm in that play box I'm focusing only on my feeling or on that picture in my mind. Then the memory box. That's after we hit the ball. So then we've hit our shot, the swing is finished, then we're processing. We're processing, uh, looking at the process we've gone through and the outcome. If it's the process, we're talking about scoring ourselves from one to four. Here, one to four based on the process. The process criteria we said earlier was the commitment level how committed were you to that shot then we said it was about maintaining the feeling in maintaining that feeling or maintaining that image while in that play box not thinking about other things being fully present in that moment on your feeling or on your picture and finally 
then how clear was the picture? How strong was the feeling? That's what we're using to judge our process score on. Then the outcome score is much simpler. What was the result? The outcome. That's all that matters for the outcome score. And again, we either it was not good, good enough, very good, good, or great. If it was not good, we're objectively analyzing uh, the situation, unemotionally explaining what happened, imagining we're having to explain our shot to somebody who didn't see it, just explaining what happened in a non-emotional, overly emotional way. If it was good enough, good or great, we want to create an emotional response, positive self-talk, authentic positive self-talk in, or, in order to store positive memories in our brain. Then after that, we want to close the door. Close the door, meaning regardless of the outcome, it could have been a hole-in-one, it could have been a triple bogey, it could have been a par, bogey, birdie, anything. We then, after we've processed, we've gone through our process and outcome scoring, we've had some positive self-talk or we've gone through um, objective analysis of the not good shot, then we, through some sort of physical movement, tapping our hat, pinching our wrist, slapping ourselves on our thigh gently, some sort of physical markation indicating that that shot is done, that's what we call closing the door. And then, that's the end, and we repeat that entire process for every shot. So that is the complete performance routine. Now, at first, it seems like a lot of information. Of course, we wouldn't normally practice all of it in one session, but the goal would be to create the skill sets to do all of this uh, after every before and during and process during every shot now it seems like a lot but really once you've done it and you've practiced each part individually it's a very quick process for example the think box that phase one phase two phase three it doesn't have to be a long process it's just at the beginning it's something you're not used to but the more you do it the more it becomes second nature and and it's a very quick a couple of seconds process so while this seems maybe confusing or like a lot to do, the more you practice it, the better you get at it, the more it'll become comfortable and become used to doing it. And it'll definitely help you have the mental skills necessary to compete in competitive tournament environments because it'll give you something to fall back on and go to no matter what, no matter how you're playing and not get lost during tournaments thinking about technical thoughts trying to search for solutions when really what you should be doing is trying to continuously put yourself in the best mental state to perform and by following this type of routine we can give ourselves a better chance of being in what we called earlier a highly high synchronicity state highly synchronous state where those puzzle pieces are matched together okay so that is the end if you have any questions or comments please feel free to leave a reach out to me. There's my contact information, or you can uh, write a comment below this video. I'd love to hear your feedback, or if you need more clarification, or if it, there's something you want me to go into more detail. Again, I recommend you research the, uh, Debbie Cruz, P. Nielsen, and Lynn Marriott. They have excellent content, excellent information as well. Thank you for your time. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Bye-bye.